Okay, we are video toing and videoing too. Uh, whatever we want to say. Uh, what do you know about railroads? Well, after this 25 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, uh, you're going to know a lot more about railroads than you've ever thought you would know. All right, so here's our map in 1865. And uh, we have no major railroads that go west. Everything is primarily concentrated in the north. We don't have very many railroad remaining railroad lines in the south because of General Sherman marching across there. And uh, there you go. Travel between New York City and Sacramento, California it takes forever. Two to three months. It's fraught with dangers, not just the journey itself, but, uh, well, yeah, the journey itself, but then you have resistance with the uh, Native Americans, you have disease, you have just general, yeah, yuck, uh, traveling across the country in Conestoga wagons. Let's see. Uh, however, if you want to get on the boat, of course, you know, you got to go the long way. So you, can, so you go from New York City all the way around South America and back up. Um, yeah. It's not a good way to get in from point A to point B. Hey, this particular map, just as I looked at it, it says uh, everybody in pink is a state, everybody in tan, gold, is a territory, and there are two places that are, what does it say? Disputed, disputed areas, and you see there's one right uh, there. We call that, you know, no man's land, right? The Oklahoma Panhandle, no man's land, 1865. But also, if you squint real hard, you can see there's Greer County, Greer County of, well, it's not Oklahoma yet because Texas is disputing it. But, and I would love to tell you all the stories about the great Greer County War, but you covered all that in Oklahoma history. So let's just move on, shall we? Ah, why did it do that? All right, give me a second. Factors that, la, 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 let's do that. And now it's all gonna be good. Factors uh, that contribute to the center of the West. All right, obviously Manifest Destiny. Gold discovered the Homestead Act and Transcontinental Railroad and the American Dream. Let's talk about those. Okay, so Manifest Destiny, just as a reminder, um, God wants us, <laughs> the Americans, to own everything from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And if you get in our way, well, don't get in our way. And so if you are a Native American, and the Native American words are coming next chapter, next video, I think. And uh, if you are, if you are another country, for example, Mexico or France or England or Russia, get out of our way, and we're going to, because otherwise we're just going to take it from you. So manifest destiny, the belief that God wants us to have that land. Now you can't get from point A to point B a lot faster than the two to three, well, the three to four months going around the long, long way. And I think I pointed this out in a different video. You could do it a little quicker if you took a boat down to Nicaragua and then crossed him. You got, got on some donkeys. He actually says that. Oh yeah, 200 jackasses. Get on, the, get on the animals and go across Nicaragua and then get on the boat and go back up. And so, let's see, does it tell me, it, it tells me it's a, the quickest, safest, and cheapest. Go across Nicaragua for only $90. So let's see, 35 days. Wow, that's pretty quick. Okay, well, so you can get from point A to point B, but you gotta pay for it. So somebody said, railroads. You know what's great about railroads? Railroads don't stop. They don't, you know, uh, oh, I'm tired. I'm gonna have to pull off on the side of the road and sleep for a little bit. No, railroads don't do that. They just keep going. They don't stop. So. Um, that extra, that extra 16 hours of the day that you're not driving, they're, they are still driving. And even though railroads may not be super fast at this point, I mean, we're looking at 40, 45 miles per hour, um, they just keep going. And that's why you get from point A to point B eventually. In 1865, 50,000 miles of railroad, mostly in the north, uh, and no rail railroads are going to go past uh, St. Louis. America experienced a tremendous railroad boom after the Civil War, and in the next 30 years, we're going to add 150,000 miles. 150,000 miles. That's a lot of miles of railroads. Uh, pretty interesting. Put it with cartoon here. We've got Lady Liberty, and she's being attacked by the railroad octopus, or squid, or whatever it is. Uh, 
before 1850, railroad, the, we're talking about the, uh, the, the, blah, 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 the railroad, now the, the ties are the, are the pieces of wood that go in, you know, the slats, and then you have the rails, right? So the rails are made out of iron. Well, you know, iron is pretty strong until you get rains on, get rained on, until it gets rained on, and uh, then it rusts. And or iron, you know, if you have pig iron or if you have wrought iron or the, all the different types of iron, um, it can be pretty brittle. So if your train is too heavy, it will snap the, the, uh, the iron rails. So you have to keep replacing them. You got to keep, you know, fixing them up. So it's kind of cost prohibitive to use iron. Well, how about steel? Hey, hey steel, right? Uh, here's the problem. Steel is very expensive. And nobody has really figured out a way to, at this point, nobody has figured out a way to do, to make a lot of steel. We had steel plows, we had steel forks and steel knives, uh, but, but we're talking about huge, you know, rails. How are we going to do this? And so the, in, uh, in walks Henry Bessemer. Look, I haven't got his name right. So Henry Bessemer uh, in 1850, he's going to allegedly <laughs> come up with a cheap way to come up uh, to make a lot of steel. Now, uh, there's an American who says that this guy stole his, his stuff, but here's what Bessemer did. He, he, got, he did his little thing and then he patented it. So if you patent it, that means you, know, you get your name on the piece of paper, you turn it in, you get credit for it. So what's the moral of the story? If you come up with an idea, patent it. Don't you know, get it copyrighted. So uh, he gets the credit. Um, so the Bessemer process. The Bessemer process, now, okay, so how do, you, how do you convert iron into steel? All right, well, here's the trick, guys. You, you blow air through it. I mean, that's pretty much it. You get rid I mean, like, seriously, that's pretty much it. To get rid of the impurities of the pig iron or the wrought iron, you, you're getting rid of, you're getting rid of uh, the nitrogen, you're getting rid of all that kind of stuff. Um, and so you, you, you blow air through it. I know, it seems pretty easy. Well, Bessemer came up with how to do it on a mass manufacturing uh, way. And so, um, there you go. So he's going to make a lot of steel, a lot of people very happy. You know, we've been able to, to change iron into steel since like the 11th century, like the, yeah, the 11th century. Over in China, they, they, were, they were doing that. And Japan was doing that with swords back in the, what, in the 1700s. So, I mean, we've been able to do that for a long time, but Bessemer gets the, the, uh, gets the credit for coming up with a way to mass market it. And once you can mass, you can mass produce uh, steel, now you can have railway, rail, railways, rail, rail, the rails on a railroad. And then you can also start to build on the Z axis, X axis, Y axis, Z axis. And so you start building on that axis and you can build skyscrapers and you can build all sorts of really tall buildings, uh, including the Empire State Building that's coming up. Once you have steel and bridges and all that kind of stuff. All right, uh, moving on. Railroads. We need to get a transcontinental railroad, trans across across the continent. Transcontinental railroad, uh, and we're going to shoot for. Let's see, we're going to start in 1869. We're going to shoot. We're going to start in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, and Sacramento, California. We're going to have two different companies. They're going to start on each end, and they're going to try to meet in the middle at some point. And you think to yourself, okay, I mean, how hard can that be to meet in the middle, right? 200 million acres of land the government is going to grant uh, these uh, railroad companies. We've already talked about how you make money on that. All right. A couple pictures of uh, in, 18, in the early 1860s here about uh, how to build railroads. Man, can you imagine? Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to work, honey. <laughs> I'll see you in years. Oof. That's like out there in the middle of nowhere. <sighs> Hope you're not claustrophobic. Some of those tunnels, right? So we talked about in the last video that the Chinese were instrumental. I mean, they were big when it came to, uh, to uh, help helping build the railroads. They work for uh, not a lot, and there you go. And so uh, we have pictures. So we have, uh, it appears 
couple of Chinese uh, workers there on the right side of the picture, posing. Yeah, that picture on the left of the of the train coming down through there. <laughs> so <laughs> they used dynamite because right, uh, dynamite it has just well has been uh, invented not too terribly long before this. Uh, and so they're blowing holes through mountains, yeah. Uh, what's pretty crazy is that they, they put, they, and this is a, a drawing, but they put people in these baskets and they haul them up on the side of the mountain with dynamite and they put the dynamite in a hole in the mountain and then they, and they light the fuse and the game becomes, can you get down from that area in your basket before boom? And then, of course, you also have to realize that when it goes boom, things are going to rain down on you. So thousands, thousands of people died. Thousands of people died doing this. Very dangerous work, very dangerous. Okay. On May 10th of 1869, we had Golden Spike Day. And so the two railroad companies met at Promontory Point, Utah. We'll see a map here in a second to drive the last spike down into the rail, and lots of pictures were taken. So let's see, uh, the, this is the, uh, the Transcontinental, goodness, excuse me, the Transcontinental Railroad is the first one to connect in the east to the west, and travel time is now, what, four to five days from New York to California. Just four to five days. I mean, you know, if you're driving in a car like in the year 2021 to go from New York City to Sac Sacramento, it takes four or five days because, I mean, you're only driving eight or nine, ten hours a day. And unless, you, you know, you're driving like somebody's wife who drives with her foot all the way down. Onto the, but, uh, I mean, but again, the choo-choo doesn't stop. Considered one of the greatest architectural achievements in American history. I'm sure it was. Sorry for the uh, potato uh, camera there, but uh, they did take some uh, pictures there, and so, yay, there they are. Uh, all the guys standing around with the with the trains back behind, and this is, this is the most famous of the pictures, I think, and so you have the two trains from the, from the com uh, competing companies there, and they are meeting their cow catchers, or put, that's kind of an interesting thing, the front of the, the front of the train is called a cow catcher, because well, you can guess why. Um, and so they, they put the cow catchers together, and then everybody took a picture. So the guy, one of the guys here in the center, I don't know which guy it is, but his name is Leland Stanford. And so he's the founder of Stanford University. So he's going to take the golden spike, and they're going to put it down to the ground. He's going to swing a giant maul and hit it. He's going to miss the, <laughs> the first time, but he's going to hit it. And there, a lot of people are going to take pictures. So then uh, after they took pictures and everybody was, you know, hugging and got all that stuff done, um, then they immediately took the golden spike out of the ground and put in a regular spike because, you know, people would be listening to their American history teachers going, okay, now exactly where is that? Yeah, they took it out. And that particular golden spike is now, the original golden spike is now at the university in Stanford. So... Those of you going to Stanford University, you can go see the spike. It is 436, 463, oh man, 464. Anyway, it's about 0.96 pounds, we're talking 436 grams, 463, it doesn't matter, but stop talking about it. Just stop talking about it. You don't, you don't remember the number. Okay. It's almost exactly one pound heavy, 73% gold, some copper alloy. But you can go see it in, in the museum. <laughs> oh, yeah, so here you go. So one group starts here in Omaha, the other group starts here in Sac uh, Sacramento, and they're going to meet. And look, oh, there it is, Promontory Point. And you say to yourself, wow, these people went a lot further than these people. Well, sure they did, because, I mean, like, well, there's nothing in Nebraska that's just flat, right? That's just you know, corn and wheat, there's nothing there. And you know, okay, Wyoming, then this becomes interesting because you know, the Rocky Mountains. Well, then you say, well, what about that? Okay, so here, this, that, then that's pretty much flat there. Well, here it's flat a little bit. But uh, you got the Sierra, Nev uh, Sierra Nevadas, Sierra Madres. Both of them had to go through mountains. So there you go. And once you get to the Transcontinental Railroad, then you get these cool flyers that say, hey, get, come to Omaha and go to California. 
through Kansas and Nebraska. Like, that's a selling point. <laughs> hey, you get to go through Kansas. I told you you're going to learn about a lot about trains here in a second. Not that you haven't already, because, you know, trains. <laughs> the railroad track was standardized um, early, or late. And so, what are we talking about? So, the railroad track itself, from the, the left side to the right side, how, how big is that? Do you know? Do you know how far it is? Can you guess right now? Can you come up with a number? How far is it from, from one track to the other track? Can you guess? I know all of you are trying to guess in feet, and you got that one person who's doing it in, in meters. But okay, so the answer the answer is four feet eight inches and a half. So four four foot eight and a half inches is the standard width. Now it can vary from four foot eight to four foot nine and a half because if you look at railroad car wheels, they're kind of parabola shaped or hyperbola shaped, I guess if you think about it. Um, and they can kind of handle that kind of stuff. But four, four, <laughs> four feet, eight inches and a half. Um, so why is this? Why is this a big deal? Dr. Jones, why, why are you giving us these numbers? I don't care. What is a big deal? Because in the South, they used a different gauge. So gauge is the difference. And so their gauge was five feet. So, well, that is a big difference because that means that all the South Railroad cars could not run on the North Railroads. And the North Railroads couldn't, you know, go on the South Railroads. So somebody had to come up with it. Okay, everybody, let's just make it like this. Um, and so, uh, there you go. And so the four foot eight and a half was actually, that came out of England. And everybody's happy and everybody's wonderful. And all the railroads in the world all fit together nicely. No, Russia doesn't. Russia, <laughs> Russia has a five-foot width. And so, you know, the anecdotal story is, uh, no, we the Soviet Union. No, we don't want to have the same width because then the bad guys can use our railroads. No, probably wouldn't like that. But it's an interesting story because, I mean, when the Germans attacked, the Germans just moved the wheels. So, okay, railroads. National signals are established. Ding, 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 ding. Uh, George Washington House develops air brakes. Ooh, air brakes. And then we start, we, uh, uh, we get developed uh, sleeping cars, the Pullman sleeping car. And how much do I want to talk about railroads? Ah, let's just stop there. In 1983, in, <laughs> in 1983, national time zone, uh, the national uh, time and time zones are established. All right. Muy importante. So, time zones. Before 1883, November 18th, 1883, uh, before that uh, happened, everybody was on local solar noon time, which means everybody who had a watch, they would wait till noon, and then when you know you didn't have a shadow, it was right below you, everybody would reset to noon. And so that's great if everybody lives in the same town. But if you have a town that you know lives over there, and uh, you know, uh, you have a different time, which if I'm a farmer and I'm like, okay, I'll be over at your place at noon. Well, then I'm in my little cart and I go over there and you know, it's, I mean, noon is noon everywhere because that's when the sun's straight up. But if you're in a railroad, railroads are now faster than everything that we've had before. And so now it's a big deal to say, okay, I'm leaving here at noon. I'm going to get there at what time? Well, to establish that, They've got to, somebody's got to come up with how we're going to do that. So in England, they they started messing around with Greenwich Mean Time, Greenwich Mean Time, um, Universal Time, uh, established off the observatory there in Greenwich. And so ultimately, you know, Ben Franklin actually proposed. It doesn't matter. Um, so uh, ultimately, it's going to come over to the United States. And so everything is based off Greenwich Mean Time over there in England. In, here in central time zone where Oklahoma is, we are six hours, we are minus six hours from Greenwich, so we are, we're six hours behind them. So when it's noon there, we are at 6 a.m. Um, so everybody between the lines is at the same time. Central time, mountain time, Pacific time, Eastern time. And I know you learned that back in third grade, but here's something that's interesting. 
you're going to remember this. This is for you people who like to get up early or you people who like to stay up late. You ready? Are you paying attention? Watch this. So here you are in Nashville. Is that Memphis? Nashville. And here you are in... <laughs> uh, here you are not quite El Paso. And the difference between Nashville and El Paso, the difference there, is about 20 degrees. I'm going to do a little math for you. It's about 20 degrees longitude. So it takes the sun four minutes to move one degree. The sun takes four minutes for one degree around the 360 degrees around, the, around you know, a 24 hour period. Okay. So if it's 20 degrees, these people are in the same, these people are all at the same time. That means in Nashville, if it's sunrise at 7 o'clock in the morning, it's still dark over here at 7 o'clock in the morning because the sun rises over here and it comes that direction. Well, we turn that direction. But, uh, so it's still dark. Well, 20 degrees times 4 minutes per degree is 80 minutes. That means if the sun rises in Nashville at 7 o'clock, it rises in El Paso at 8.20. So you can sleep in a little bit. Also, the sun goes down later. If the sun goes down at 7 o'clock in the, in, the in the evening in Nashville, the sun's still up until 8.20 in the evening in El Paso. So, here's why this is important for you. When you decide that you're going to relocate and go to, you know, whatever college you want to go to or you want to go live somewhere else, you get all grown up and you go move out of the house, if you like to get up early, and you like the sun to be in your eyes and get up and accomplish things and you know, you're one of those go-getter alpha people. You want to be, <laughs> Chicago would be good. Chicago would be good. Uh, Nashville would be good. Uh, whatever, is that uh, St. Augustine? I don't know. If you're one of those people who like to get up late and then stay up later and have longer evenings, well, maybe you should be looking at the Oklahoma Panhandle. Uh, so that would be what... Uh, Gaiman, <laughs> or way out here in the Texas Panhandle, or out in the middle of nowhere in uh, North Dakota. All right. Is that enough about time periods? Is that enough? All right, let's see. China has only one time period for their entire country. The country that has the most time periods. I know you're saying Russia because it's really, really big. No, it's actually France. Why is that? France has 12 different time zones. Also, here's a fun fact about time zones. Not everybody is just one hour apart. So, for example, India is plus five and a half hours from, uh, from Greenwich Mean Time, and Nepal is like five, and a, five hours and 45 minutes ahead. And it's just weird. I don't know. In Malaysia, and Newfoundland is minus three and a half hours. Or Okay, stop talking. Stop talking. Moving on. <laughs> Sorry, guys. The railroad's impact. Transportation of people and goods was quicker and cheaper than obvious. New era of interstate trade and commerce in 1865. It cost $3.45 to go from Chicago, from New York to Chicago or vice versa. And then just uh, th uh, 25 years later, it cost less. That's kind of weird to actually say something cost less in the future. Lots of new jobs for the Irish and the Chinese. And we talked about in the last video, the Chinese, so many Chinese came over here. We said no more Chinese, the Chinese exclusion law. Westward expansion, safe, quick, cheap, Native American wars and, remo <laughs> and removal of the Native Americans, uh, which we'll get to in the next video. Oh, wait, I guess we actually will. Oh, no, there's more. Let's go. Sorry, got a couple more slides. Uh, monopolies, two types of monopolies. So we have vertical and horizontal. So vertical monopoly. A vertical monopoly is when you own everything that involves that product. So, for example, uh, Andrew Carnegie, Carnegie, he's going to be in charge of steel. And so I say he's not in charge, but he owns the mine. He owns the mine workers. He owns the trucks that go from the mine to the factory. He owns the factories. He owns the... The, the patents to change the iron into steel. He owns the companies that transport from point A to point B to point C. He owns the, the sellers. He owns, the, he owns everything so he can set the price. He owns everything. He can set the price. He doesn't have to worry about 
the mine the mine workers doing something and raising the prices because he owns the mine. He doesn't have to worry about the truckers because he owns the truckers. So there's that. That's a vertical a vertical monopoly. Then we have a horizontal uh, monopoly. And so this is uh, Rockefeller's. Rockefeller, uh, uh, he's going to be the oil monopoly guy, and his he doesn't own, own he doesn't own the oil rigs. He doesn't necessarily own the oil uh, uh, the oil refining. I, he probably does, but he owns all of the oil selling companies, like all of them. All the way across the board. He doesn't own up and down. He owns across. So horizontal. That makes sense to you guys. Um, and so both of these guys are monopoly uh, monopoly uh, tycoons, which the Sherman Antitrust Act. They're going to they're going to go after these guys here in a little bit. All right. So Carnegie is steel and Rockefeller is oil. You can remember that. Carnegie is steel. Rockefeller is oil. Uh, Andrew Carnegie is going to write a book called The Gospel of Wealth. It's kind of interesting. He says, uh, his short version is, hey, if you're a self-made billionaire, well, not quite billionaire, well, they were very close. They were still millionaires because we didn't have a billionaire quite yet. But if you're a self-made super rich guy, um, good for you. It's the gospel of wealth. Good for you. But here's what you need to know. You know, some people say the person who dies that has the most toys wins. If you have the most toys and you die, you win. Uh, Carnegie is the exact opposite of that. He says, if you're super rich and you're super rich when you die, man, you're a terrible human being. Because before you die, you need to do, you need to bequeath. You need to give away all of your money. You need to, you need to, uh, you need to help people out. Wow, look at that. Um, you need to have responsible philanthropy. So philanthropy is... Uh, giving your money, giving your time to help others, and you don't get anything back except for your own self-worth, and you get to write stuff on your resume. <laughs> How's that? How are your uh, your hours coming on your volunteer hours? Right? Don't give money to your heirs. <laughs> well, this is kind of interesting. So, if you're super, super rich, in your will, give all your money away to not your not. Your kids. Your kids need to earn it themselves. Oof. I mean, I'm not worried about it because my parents are both teachers, so. <laughs> uh, don't give money to charities unless you're in charge of the charity. Why? Because charities tend to skim skim money off. Uh, boss Tweed. Um, give using utilitarian ideas. Oh, utilitarian. What is that? What is that? We order pepperoni and cheese pizza. Utilitarian. And if you die rich, you lose this human being. Right, okay. Here's the last slide. And I actually just want to leave you with these questions. What do you know about that material? Um, what do you know about unions? How do unions work? Who, who uh, decides if you have a union? What are the pros and cons of having a union? I'm asking you these questions, uh, and you're going to want to know some of these answers. What is a yellow dog contract versus other contracts? Not a blue dog or purple dog. What is a yellow dog contract? The National Labor Union, the Knights of Labor, those two different groups, who are they? Why are they important? How did they get so important that they made it onto my slide? Uh, who are those people? What happened during the Hay, May, the Hay Market Square riots, other than saying there were riots? Um, gosh, where am I going to find out all this information? Well, it's all in your uh, textbook, or you can always just, you know. Uh, and then the American Federation of Labor, the AFL. Okay, and then, oh, finally, closed shop. What is an open shop? What is a closed shop? What would you guess schools are? Are we open or closed? Well, I guess you're going to have to find out what the, uh, what, what the definition is. Uh, there you go. And our particular state, ooh, that's a great question. Our, oh, you know what? That's going to be our Friday question. Our particular state, how do we treat, how do we treat this kind of stuff? All right, I think I'm done for the week. And that's all you need to know about railroads and time zones. No, I've got a lot more, but you don't want to hear it. I'll catch you on the flip side. Be good.